And it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. You also heard quite a lot from Ulrike's talk about Dr. Helen, Helen Sharp, who is senior lecturer in Edinburgh University our last day again. <laughs> it is great pleasure to see you today here, yeah. Helen. Over to you. Yeah, thanks everyone for having me today. As Ulrika said, King's was my academic home uh, where I started my academic career, so it's really lovely to be back. And I was reflecting, it was actually yeah, 10 years ago today, I think that we were well in this air era that we were writing up the Ariadne report. So somehow there's some poetry there. Um, so uh, as Kate said, I'm now based at the University of Edinburgh. I work in the Eating Disorders and Behaviours Research Group up there, and I'm going to present to you um, a new study that we're about to launch as part of the Edify program. And the focus is really around how we can use big data to identify um, targets for prevention and early intervention programs. Um, so I'm probably going to be unusual today in that I don't have any data to present to you. This is all hot off the press, about to launch. So I'm hopefully going to whet your appetite and maybe in a year or two we'll be able to tell you what we found. So this project is building on um, really thinking about what recovery means in the context of eating disorders. And we've heard already this morning, um, we know that the eating disorders still, despite you know, 150 years worth of really good quality research, have some of the lowest sustained recovery rates across the mental health disorders. And we know that recovery is a very complex process. So in, in very strict clinical trials, we tend to think about recovery as remission of core symptoms, but when we speak with people who have lived experience of eating disorders, they talk about a much broader process um, that encompasses changes in their, in their wider life. We also know that there's a lot of variation in the course of eating disorders, so onset, progression and recovery between individuals. And as has been mentioned many times today, the peak onset is during adolescence. So we have this added complexity of the developmental um, perspective, the, this developmental period. So bringing all of this together in terms of thinking about recovery processes, we, we really know and we need to accept that one size is not going to fit all in this context. So we need to be thinking now about how we develop more personalized prevention and intervention approaches that are really tailored to those individual circumstances and illness stages. So we've been thinking a lot about this over the past few years. What does this mean in practice? Um, and here are some of my reflections on, on, on what we might need to be what we might need to be doing. So the first is really just embracing that idea that there's not going to be a single path here. So for those of you who study developmental psychology, um, the, uh, the concept of equ equifinality might be familiar. This idea that there's multiple pathways into the same outcome. So we just need to embrace that. Um, so this means some, from a statistical perspective that we're not we want to look at some of this individual variation and not just try to look at the common path. Second, we need to uh, acknowledge that risk factors and protective factors don't occur in isolation. Now, we've seen some excellent examples this morning of where people are putting this into practice, really looking at lots of factors all together and how they interact with each other. So we need studies that measure these all these different factors and then look at them uh, in interaction with each other. Third, we need to think about the whole person in their context. So not just the individual characteristics, but the um, uh, but all the different aspects of their identity that may intersect with each other and the point has already been made today we really really need to push for more diverse representative samples in eating disorder research because if we don't have that we can never build these predictive models that are going to work for the diverse group of people who are impacted by eating disorders so we need to make our studies work for diverse groups and i think there's going to be other talks today that speak a little bit to how we might be able to do that Finally, um, we need to start thinking about recovery and uh, illness progression as a dynamic process, so something that happens in everyday life. Um, now, I've done lots of work on cohort studies and I, I love that work. Um, the, and typically what we have there in these good quality cohort studies is multiple assessments over periods of um, months to years, which gives us really good quality data for certain types of questions. But if we want to understand what are the processes that are driving recovery, we need to capture the data in the time frame that those processes are happening. And arguably those are the process of minutes, hours, days, rather than these very long jumps. 
So I won't speak much about the Edify Consortium because it's been raised a few times today, but just to say that there are these six work streams and um, Ulrika and I co-lead this um, consortium. And the study I'm going to present to you today is um, an amalgamation of um, workstream three and three and four, recovery and illness stage and progression. And just to say, uh, for those of you who are quick enough with your smartphones, you can sign up to the Edify newsletter here using this QR code, and then you'll get a quarterly update on, on what we're up to. So the story study. Um, is the study I'm going to present to you today. It's a very big, new, ambitious study that we are about to launch. STORY stands for Characterizing Illness Stage Progression and Recovery Trajectories of Eating Disorders in Young People. And you can see lots of smiling faces on this screen. Um, down the left-hand side, you'll see all of our fabulous um, research team. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see um, our absolute brainiacs from the radar team who are helping us with uh, and and collaborating with us uh, in the data collection. Um, so the story study has two aims. It's aiming to collect real world data on how um, physiological and psychological factors influence the recovery from eating disorders, and also to uh, look at how biopsychosocial and neurocognitive symptom profiles shift across illness duration and might differ between um, age groups and diagnoses. And collectively, we hope that down the line, this will help us to step in earlier and prevent eating disorders from progressing further and to tailor treatments to um, illness stages. So we're really going back to these kind of fundamental questions to hopefully lead us to those more personalised intervention. So, as I say, we are about to launch. About a month ago, I was sort of hoping we might be here to be able to say, like, the launch is today, it's happening. But obviously, there's always bureaucracy, so we are imminent. Three to four weeks, we will be there. It's um, an ambitious new cohort of young people with eating disorders in the UK. So we're going to be recruiting 840 young people. That's going to include people with eating disorders of different diagnoses and different um, durations, as well as 120 um, healthy young people as controls. So if you're thinking through your mind of people who might be eligible, basically anybody is eligible if they're aged 16 to 25, as long as they haven't recovered from an eating disorder. So that's our only group who are out. Everybody else is in. Um, and you'll see on this uh, on the right hand side of the slide, we've got lots of sites and services who are already signed up, already shown their interest. The red ones are people who are in. The green ones are people who are in conversation with us and nearly in. But we are we will be constantly bringing new sites on board. Um, the really interesting thing, other than just the scope of this, is that we're going to be doing deep phenotyping of this cohort over a period of one year using remote measurement technology, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, alongside neuroimaging and other more standard uh, psychological and psychiatric assessments. So we're going to get loads of data. Um, and I should also say the uh, beautiful graphics on these slides in this section have been uh, made by Karina Kuna, who's one of our research assistants, an absolute pro on all things design. So I cannot take any credit for these. Um, so this is to give you a bit of a sense of the um, uh, structure of the study. We'll have all our young people come in. They'll do an online screening assessment. If they're deemed eligible, they'll be brought into an online baseline assessment. And this is all the standard psychological tests um, and self-report measures. And we've set this study up so that it can be done almost, well, from the majority of participants, it can be done fully remotely. So we're hoping to get people from the Scottish Highlands right the way down to Cornwall, wherever. Um, people can do it. They don't need to be able to come in. We do have um, some additional aspects where people can come into the Institute here and some of them up to the University of Edinburgh. This is the neuroimaging tasks and some in-person cognitive testing. But those are optional elements that go alongside the core, the core study. They'll also have uh, follow up assessments at six months and 12 months. And then the really interesting bit is this remote measurement period, which is going to be continuous for this full year. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this now. So this is where our collabor collaboration with the radar team has been so incredibly helpful. Um, we had this idea of like, oh, maybe we could do this. And then there we go, round the corner in Kings, we have the leading world experts in this type of research. Absolutely brilliant. So what will happen is the young people will come into the study. They will be, um, uh, they will be, they will use a mobile phone, so it could be their own mobile phone, or if they don't have a um, an Android mobile phone, uh, we will give one to them, which they can keep. And there will be two apps, one active app, which 
basically prompts for little questions and one passive app which basically collects all the information off the back end of their mobile phone so things like their um the the light sensor on the phone the bluetooth connectivity these kinds of things so all things the phone's collecting anyway pulls to us but they're also going to wear an aura ring that's this thing down in the bottom right hand corner it's it's basically like a smart ring well it is a smart ring um and it collects all sorts of data similar to what um a fitness or diet tracker might might capture on your wrist. The great thing about the Aura Ring is you cannot see any of the data that I've collected. So rather than, for example, if you were wearing a Fitbit that pings and says things, this thing doesn't do any of that. It just sits there quietly. Um, and it's possible to also blind the data on the app side. So the um, basically the participants won't be able to see anything. And this will collect all of those moment to moment changes in some of the physi physiological measures. Really, really interesting. And just to wrap up, so I hope this has whetted your appetite a little bit about this study. We're really, really excited about it. I have to say, I think it's the yeah, the scariest and most exciting study I've been involved with. Um, and um, it really has the potential, I think, to provide a step change for us in how we understand um, eating disorders in a diverse group of young people and these recovery and illness um, progression processes. We hope to be able to use all of this to guide um, targets for new interventions and that might be things that young people can tell us themselves a self-report this moment this change in mood these kinds of things but it might also be things that are coming from these data that are being gathered by their mobile phone or the aura ring that maybe they're not able to they're not aware of not able to articulate that could be these early warning signs and there's some evidence that's coming from other conditions that that that, that, that these things are the case and as you can imagine, this is a mega big cohort. There's going to be so much data. We hope that this will provide, it will basically be a resource that in addition to us, many other researchers will be able to access and really mine this and start to um, uh, yeah, make use of it to be able to translate this into um, uh, findings that can, that can impact clinical practice. So as with the other talks, I'm presenting this. I'm it's definitely not just me and this team. There's a big team of researchers behind me. We also have extremely talented um, youth advisors who've been really helping us through this process, especially navigating the minefield of the wearable tech and how we do that safely in this context. So big thank you to everyone there. And yes, happy to take any questions. Next, Lucy, can we have my mic here? Thank you. Thanks for that great overview of the story study. Um, I was just wondering about, obviously it's a longitudinal design over a, a year. Mm -hmm. um, so I was an RA on a similar study for mm -hmm. participants with depression. We found sometimes engagement was quite difficult. So I was just wondering about your plans to keep people engaged in the study and also considering a sample if there's kind of well-being checks along the way. Yeah, yeah, oh, thanks, yeah, yeah, oh, no, that is a big concern of ours as well. Once we've got this set up, how do we keep people in? And um, we've, we've got a number of strategies which we hope will work, and I'd be curious to hear if other people have other things we can put in place. So I think the first thing, and for me, probably the most important, is to link each researcher with an individual participant. So there'll be that personal connection between the participant and the researcher, so it won't be sort of like, unknown research team and the participant looking in. So I think that will be really important. And then we have, so the, the key checking points, right, are at the baseline six months, 12 months, but in between that, we're gonna have a system of very light touch checking from those researchers, just to keep that, that link in. Um, we also have quite a lot of merch, so you might see some of us wearing merch. You can go to our, our stand uh, uh, in the lunch break, and we we hope that that will also help to ha to give the study um, a real presence um, and and yeah keep both participants, but also our clinicians and people working in youth work and education who are working with us engaged. Great, thank you. Thanks ever so much.